Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 709 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's guest has type 1 diabetes and has had it for quite some time. The way she was diagnosed is unique. She also has a lot more going on than just type 1. Today's guest is Hannah, and she's here to tell us her story. While you're listening, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Are you a U.S. resident who has type 1 diabetes or is the caregiver of someone with type 1? If you are, please take a moment to go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Join the registry, take the survey, help people living with type 1 diabetes. Easy questions to easy answers about type 1 diabetes await you at that link. When you answer, you're supporting people with type 1 and the Juice Box podcast. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box podcast is sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. Learn more and get started today at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. You may be eligible for a free 10 day trial of the Dexcom G6. Find out at my link. Today's podcast is also sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. ContourNext.com forward slash juice box is where you're headed. When you get there, everything you need to know about the Contour Next One will be right before your eyes. ContourNext.com forward slash juice box. Get the blood glucose meter that I just used five minutes ago. My name is Hannah and I am a type one diabetic. Yeah, see, that was easy, wasn't it, Hannah? Right. <laughs> right. Are you futzing? Are you touching things with your hands? Uh, I was a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold it together, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is what it sounded like. Hi, I'm Hannah. And I'm like, and then there was a, and I was like, uh-oh, she's nervous already. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Hannah, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I was uh, 20 months old. Oh, and how old are you now? I am 26. Wow. That was 24 years ago. Yeah, my anniversary, my 25th anniversary will be um, in the beginning of January. You were diagnosed around the holidays. Yes. So that's part of your story, isn't it? It is. Oh, wait, yes. Oh, wait, stop, stop. <laughs> Hannah, you're her, aren't you? Don't say why, but you are, right? Right. You, you're, oh, oh, okay. This is exciting. Hold on. Everyone calm down. And by everyone, I mean me. Hannah's going <laughs> to tell us something that no one's ever said on here before. And I'm going to have a hard time not laughing when you tell me. Okay. I think I'm right <laughs> about this. Am I right about this? Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Let's go slow. Um, <laughs> oh, now I'm so excited. Um, see, this is the joy you get when you don't pre-plan. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> um, 20 months old. Are you, were you your parents' only child or... Do you have brothers and sisters? I have um, four or three other sisters and then two brothers, and I'm the youngest. That's six children, right? Yes. Okay. So you're the youngest of six. And so did any of the other kids have diabetes? No, not at that time. No. Not at that time. My um, One of my older brothers was diagnosed um, near his 32nd birthday. Oh, Interesting other side of the spectrum. Okay, so you're t you're 20 months old. Is that like bottles and, I mean, you're toddling, right? You walk by 20 months. Yes, but right? still in diapers. Um, and I think at that point, you're at your like sippy cups or whatever, like that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, hold on one second. Oh, my mom. Hold on a second. Sorry, my mom's not been feeling well. She's asking me a question. 
I'm telling her I can call Aww. her. Later. Okay, so you're sippy bottling and that kind of toddling around. But I'm imagining too, the other five are in the house, right? It's not like your parents, like you weren't like an oops baby, were you? Like there was a, a tight family of like six kids all n- near the same age? We're not all near the same age. My oldest is 14 years apart from me, but yeah. still, I was very much um, planned and everything yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's a gap of time, but it's not, it's not to say that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, when you're like, you're, Correct. you're, you're 27 right. <laughs> and you've got a six year old daughter or brother or sister or something like that. Um, okay. So, all right, go ahead. What, what did your parents tell you about? this time because I'm assuming you don't remember it being 20 months old no so the other day I was at my parents house and I brought a piece of paper and a pen and I said tell me a little bit about my diagnosis story just because I don't know much about that time um, besides the main event which we'll get to later yeah Um, and my dad was telling me that I kind of asked them you know when did you start noticing um, all these signs of diabetes. And they said, like, we didn't really know what to look for at that time. Um, but my dad would tell me that he would give me a bath. He'd put me in a clean diaper, leave me downstairs to, you know, do whatever toddlers do at that point. And then he'd come back downstairs and my diaper would be soaking. Like there would not be any room for any more pee in there. Mm-hmm. Um, And my parents called doctor um, and said, you know, all these things are kind of happening. I was, would take a bath and I would drink this faucet water. I would keep drinking it until like I threw up because I drank so much and hanging on the door of the refrigerator, asking for juice and water, anything to drink. And they just said it was a virus. And my mom was like, just a virus? Like, okay, Um, you let me know what you want me to talk about the main event. (laughs) I could keep going. No, no, it's okay. So you're 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 thirsty and um and they're checking with doctors. They tell it's a virus. Nobody's anything. So I mean, go ahead. What's the thing that pushes your parents over the edge and makes them think, wow, something has to be really wrong? So my parents, um, I believe, you know, just it was at nighttime, around Christmas time. There is a Christmas tree in our house, and the funny kind of like joke about it now is that my mom thought she had the healthiest tree. She was like, this thing is drinking so much water. I have to keep refilling it over and over again. Like it is such a healthy tree. And then my parents found me one day drinking out of the Christmas tree water container, like a dog, because I was so thirsty. And then at that point, my parents are like, this is not just a virus. And I can't tell if that's the saddest or funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. I just can't figure it out. I I am surprised that my toddler self that I was able to like MacGyver this way of getting water when my parents were like, no, like you've already had so much juice and water that my 20 month old self was able to find a source of water for me to drink. It's just it's such a good example of the veracity of the feeling, right? Like because. I mean, you're just you're just this little like water seeking missile in your house, you know. Right. You know, you're if you're in the bathtub, you're drinking there. If you're at the, you know, if somebody nearby, you're like, hey, refrigerator, bring me something, you know, give me something to drink. And when all else fails, God, do you think you ever drank out of the toilet? I don't know. I probably not because we had cats, so I assumed that they kept the toilet seats closed. But I also had two brothers. And they mm-hmm. probably didn't put the toilet seat down, so I don't know. Let's not Unsure. think about it. Let's not think about it. We'll just assume, <laughs> we just assume. I, I mean, like I have a picture of you, like you know, for people who don't bring trees in their house at Christmas time. I, I mean, you, you don't think about it, but they're like little spiders in them. Like pine needles are falling out of them pretty constantly. The water is really dirty by the time Christmas is over, and you throw it away because those things are falling down into it. The tree right. is soaking in it. And you're down there just like, like finding a way to get the water out of there. That's crazy. Yeah. No, it really is crazy. Um, it's like the worst Grinch story ever. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, is <laughs> did your dad have a remembrance? Your mom have a remembrance of going to the doctor and going like, hey, she's drinking out of the Christmas tree? So my parents gave, after that, they gave a call to like the on-call doctor or whoever at that time. And 
the doctor said to bring them to Children's. And at that point, Children's was like a decent drive away from us. My parents were like, do we really, you know, like, yes, we're going to go. Um, and then at that point, they, I kind of asked them, you know, do you remember what my blood sugar was? Do you remember any of my labs? Um, kind of that sort of objective piece. And they just said that I, they remember that my blood sugar was 700s hmm. when I got there. Wow, wow. How long do they think it was going on for when, when they look back in hindsight? See, I asked them that and they, they don't quite remember, but they also don't really remember. Like they weren't really looking for anything. Yeah. They just noticed that all of a sudden, you know, we, I was having all these wet diapers. I was, you know, wanting all this water and juice and I was losing like weight. Um, but my parents thought I was just going through a growth spurt. And that's why I wanted water and why I was like losing weight because maybe I was growing taller, mm-hmm. getting a little leaner at that point. Yeah. You have to imagine and, too, like 14 years, you've raised five kids. This is the sixth one. Nothing major has gone wrong, right? There's no other health issues with your brothers and sisters, are there? Not at this point um, in, in my life yeah, yeah. in 1997, did any of them really have any health problems? Yeah, right. So your parents are just like, this is easy. Like we have sex and then the kids get older and it's fine. You know, like there's there's not a lot for them to think about and no reason to consider that something might be significantly wrong with you. Even, I mean, the Christmas tree thing though is, it's just, I don't know. It's a, it seems like another level in hindsight. You know what I mean? Um, right. So 1997. Wow, that makes me feel terribly old. <laughs> Life goes by goes by so quickly, Hannah. Don't don't it under, does. don't undervalue that at all. Like, cause try to imagine. Like, how old were your parents in ninety seven ish? Do you think? Oh boy, um, they're probably in their like mid to upper thirties. Okay. At that point. And now they're almost. My mom had me when I was 35. So she must have been, you know, 36, 37. My dad is a couple of years younger. Gotcha. So now they're in their mid 50s, upper 50s now. Yep. Yeah. But it just goes so quick. Like in 97, like I was, I had just gotten married. Like I was like such a young person. I'm sitting here, I'm 50 years old. And you, <laughs> and you're like, you know, back in 97, I was like, that was recently. And then I realized <laughs> it wasn't. And I'm almost dead. That's what I, but it's exactly what it made me think. Like by the time you have a story like this about your younger children, I'll be gone. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like when you're sitting around, you're like, I remember when my kids were blah, blah, blah. You'll be like, and there used to be this guy on this podcast, but he's dead now. So um, anyway, all right. So what happens? Do they send them home with, I mean, back then, what are we talking about? Needles? Regular yes. MP was it was it fast acting insulin at least? No, no right? my parents had to mix. Um, they called it RNN, so yep. I assume it was regular and NPH yep. insulin. Um, and they would have to mix it like manually, draw it up in the syringe, and then at that time they told my parents of a twenty month old that you'd have to give the insulin fifteen minutes before they ate. So you first have to assume what I was going to eat at 20 months old Mm -hmm. and then also like give me the shot and then have me sit down and eat like at that 15 minute mark when you know the peak of the insulin was occurring yeah and me being a toddler I didn't always eat my meals fully um and my parents would always say that say that I would say you know all done and they're like you're not all done you still have half your sandwich and half your yogurt, you are not all done. <laughs> so then they would force me, you know, to either eat that or being a toddler, if I said absolutely not, um, they would give me frosting just to make sure I didn't go low. Yeah. Wow. That sucks. And there's no, I mean, so people are listening, there's no glucose monitors, um, no. like continuous glucose monitors. Um, testing is probably even a little hinky. Right. I mean, the meters are probably OK back then, but not not like they are now even. Right. It's scary. I remember it's like this big black and white AccuCheck that you would have to get so much blood onto the strip to like actually be able to get a reading. Mm. Yeah. So they're doing that. How often do you think they were doing that with you? Did they say? I feel like at the time it was probably 
four or five times a day. Mm-hmm. And that's when my dad, he started getting up at three in the morning every single morning until I was 18 to check my blood sugar. Wow. Is 18 when you moved to a different insulin or when you had glucose? That's when I went to college and I had to do it by myself. Oh, he did it every day? Every day. Oh, that's sweet. Okay. Um, When did you switch to faster acting insulin? So fast so Lantus and fast acting insulin didn't happen until 2000 Mm -hmm. and they feel like Lantus. They said, I pretty much started automatically on when it came out. It was like the new and latest technology to help help keep blood sugars, you know, stable throughout the day. And my diabetes clinic at the time really pushed for that to be started right away. So I was probably in like preschool or, kindergarten when I started that. And I believe I started fast acting probably right around the same time. Okay. But it was still needle like syringes. Yeah. At yeah. That time. yeah. 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 No, for sure. Um, what, what's your first memory of diabetes? Oh, that's a hard question. I remember going to like the office at school when I was first grade ish because there was another girl in my grade who also had diabetes. So at that point we had a school nurse that had to go to like five different schools in the district and my parents and the parents of this other type one diabetic kind of got together and said, Hey, let's split the lunchtime shots. And so I remember going to the office and having either my dad, my mom, or the parents of this other type one diabetic giving me shots for lunch. Oh, wow. Well, that's a thoughtful way to split up the duty, right? Yeah. My parents said it didn't last very long because they're like liabilities and whatever with insulin, which totally makes sense, you know, looking back on it. But yeah, I also it's kind of a good, easy way to do it if they could do it that way. No, I was thinking like, I can't believe the school let like another person like give insulin to like a, a third party's child. No. So my parents, yeah, my parents could still give me shots. But then they couldn't give the other type one diabetic um, okay. her shots. So the splitting of duties chain didn't last too long. And then you right. guys were all, <laughs> all there at the same time every day. Yep. Wow. Until what age? What time? At what age did you start giving yourself insulin at school? Do you remember? I I don't think they let me really do it by myself until I was in middle school. I was around fifth grade. Mm-hmm. Wow. But. Okay. I started learning how to give my own shots by the time I was eight. Gotcha. Um, because I was sick of my parents coming to school um, to give my own shots. So I really wanted to learn how to do it myself. Yeah. I would just think I remember just... like one day in the living room, my mom taught me how to do it, but I was so scared of doing my own shots because mm-hmm. I thought it was going to hurt, even though I knew it didn't hurt. I think it was just the new aspect that. I was now doing it to myself versus my parents doing it. Well, gosh, it's so here's what's interesting is that you've had diabetes for so long and yet you're so young. Right. You you know, like it's just, it's a weird juxtaposition. Like it's hard to remember during the conversation that you've had it for such a long time, but your memories of it don't, don't exist for as long as you've had it. Um, right. So you started doing your injections around fifth grade. That stops them from coming to school. Um, yeah. But does it change when you go back home? Like, is it just you during the day and then they take back over again? Or did it just completely fall on to you at that point? No, I, mo- I could have done it by myself, but I had a lot of issues with scar tissue. Um, and I think between third and you know seventh grade I really liked going in the same like four spots <laughs> so my dad is like well I'll give you your breakfast shot um like in my like upper butt kind of area so that I didn't get scar tissue so it was kind of helping me rotate sites yeah I think that's pretty common with little kids they get it in their head that it like the needle goes in a certain place and then eventually yep. you kind of beat that area up a little bit so you don't have as much feeling there and then going somewhere new feels like it hurts because right. you have this deadened um, 
area that you've been using. But like you said, then scar tissue, did you get like the, um, the weird skin underneath even from there being too much insulin there over and over? Do you remember? Gosh, it's so funny. You're still um, little. I remember going to the diabetes clinic and then being like, feels like you have some scar tissue. Cause it'd be like lumpy. Yeah. I remember them describing it as lumpy. And they're like, if you feel that, that means that you're putting too much insulin there and it's not getting fully absorbed. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I know. I just, I like those spots. They, I know they don't hurt, you know? Yeah. No, I hear you. So how was your care through then? Do you, did, when you spoke with your parents, did they have any, any remembrances? Like, how did they think about your health? I guess is my question. It was w- different back then. I mean, there was no... Like I didn't get a pump until I was a sophomore in high school. Mm-hmm. So up until that point, I was on injections and I didn't have a glucose sensor. Those weren't a thing either. Um, so for the technology that I had, I felt like I did pretty good. I never was in DKA um, besides like I would have to go to the hospital. I remember when I was younger, when I get really sick with either like the stomach flu or a cold And then I'd kind of lead into this point where like, you're almost in DK to have ketones on the P stick. And then I have to go to, you know, the ER to get some fluids. But I felt like until I got the pump, I was like pretty well controlled. Do I remember my A1Cs from back then? I think it was like in the eights, but I don't think it was like considered like terribly uncontrolled. Do you have like a lot of memories about the hospital? I have memories of going to the diabetes clinic. Okay, but a not, lot. not being hospitalized though. No. Okay. Okay. Um so you alluded a couple of times about like later there's other stuff. So do you have any other autoimmune issues? Dexcom is a continuous glucose monitor. It measures your blood sugar, and reports it back on Dexcom's receiver or on an iPhone or an Android. What do you get to see? The number of your blood sugar, say it's 120, the direction of your blood sugar, it's going up, it's going down, it's staying stable, and the speed in which it's moving in one of those directions. Is it moving at two points per minute, three, et cetera, and so on. Dexcom shows you all of this. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. When you get to the website, you have all kinds of options. You can read more about the Dexcom G6, or you can jump right in, enter your information, and find out if you have coverage. Everything can happen right there on my link. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. It could be a learning expedition or a getting started kind of a day for you. If I was you, I would check out Dexcom very carefully. It is a pivotal part of how we manage my daughter's type 1 diabetes every day. Make knowledge your superpower with the Dexcom G6. And when you get to that website, after you've all looked around, if you haven't done anything, on my browser, I don't know how yours works, but if I try to close the window, I hit the little X, it says, ooh, before you go, are you interested in a free Dexcom G6 sample? Well, maybe I am. Dexcom is offering you a 10-day trial that empowers you to make more informed decisions and deliver a new level of diabetes management. Request a sample right there. Terms and conditions, of course, apply, but there's only one way to find out for sure. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Everyone using insulin has a blood glucose meter, but everyone using insulin doesn't have a great one. And sometimes they're not so accurate. Having that information be accurate as possible, that's a pretty basic first step. And with the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, you are going to get accuracy. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. This is the meter that my daughter's been using for years now. The test strips are amazing. You get the uh, little, um, you put the little, like uh, the strip on the blood there. And if you don't get enough blood, no big deal. Strip still works. You can go back in and get more. They call that second chance testing. When you get to my link, contournext.com forward slash juice box, there's a ton of stuff for you to learn. And as a matter of fact, 
I'm looking at this link right now. It's been updated. Look at everybody's been busy updating their links. They've got some great customer uh, feedback here right on the link. Amazing deal, cheaper for me than buying through insurance. I got 50 more strips for about the same price. Expiration dates were good, plus they arrived very quickly. Very happy with the purchase. Same product works well and half the price of what I pay after insurance at the pharmacy. We'll definitely buy again. Oh, these are walmart.com purchases of the meter and test strips. Oh, look at this. There's like a little buy now link here you click on and it takes you. Oh yeah, you can get it at walmart.com, Amazon, Walgreens, all online right through my link. My link is amazing. CVS, Pharmacy, Rite Aid, Target, Kroger, and some stuff I can't pronounce. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. You need a great meter. You need it to be reliable. You need to have a bright light, an easy to read screen. You need it to be easy to carry. And the Contour Next one is all of those things. And bonus, it's really accurate. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. I do. Um, I have a hypothyroid. Um, and that, that started in sixth grade because my teacher found me falling asleep in class. Um, and at first they thought it was blood sugar, of course. So they're like, is she low? Right. Is her blood sugar low? And it's like, no, she's just really sleepy. Um, and then I recently, it was about three years ago, I was diagnosed with a form of like dysautonomia which is autoimmune and they believe it's kind of related to diabetes. And it actually led me um, to getting a pacemaker on my 26th birthday this year. Wow. That's not a happy birthday. Hold on a second. Let's do this together. Dis. All right. A dysfunction of the nerves that regulate non-voluntary body functions such as heart rate, blood pressure, and sweating. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, how did that, like, present? What were your first so, signs? Yeah. I I remember in, like, college, it happened a couple times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom or whatever, and then I'd all of a sudden start feeling, like, tunnel visioned and kind of get like black spots and then I'd either pass out or like near pass out. And I always thought it was like dehydration or I don't know. I was also in nursing school. So stress. And then one day after I graduated, I was like at a bookstore, just minding my own business. And I felt it coming on and I was like, you know what? I'll just like sit on the ground for a second. And then I remember waking up on the ground. Um, and I was pretty freaked out. So I was like, this has never happened to me in daylight before. Mm -hmm. um, went to the ER at that point and they sent me home, sent me to a electrophysiologist to kind of get the diagnosis of dysautonomia. And then about maybe a couple weeks prior to the final incident that led me to get a pacemaker, I felt like a increase in these episodes, maybe not fully passing out, but just feeling like absolute um, crap um, and just not feeling great. And then I was at work where I kind of had these like pre-syncope episodes before work. And I was like, I'm still going to go to work. I'm fine. And then at work, I ended up having an episode where I, I ultimately fully passed out. And I, I, I work as a nurse. So they're all like, you're going to go to the ER. And I said, no, no, I'm fine. I'll just go home. And then I called my doctor and like, no, you really need to go to the ER. And I was like, fine. Then I passed out again in the ER um, with monitors on and I had a 14 second pause in my heart. And they said that was way too long. So Hannah, to be serious for a second, because we started off yeah. with you drinking out of a Christmas tree. Um, this is this is a serious condition, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, are you married? Uh, I have a fiance. Fiance. You have any kids? No. No. Um, I, I mean, unless my reading's way off here, and I'm not, I want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Dysautonomia. Is that right? Dysautonomia. Close. Dys Dysautonomia. Okay. It, 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 did they tell you you have a shortened life expectancy from this? 
No. They did not say that. Okay. No. They said, like, with the pacemaker that could, there's, a, a, like, a kind of, like, a, I don't want to say deadly heart rhythm because it's not, per se, deadly, but it's just hard to come out of. If you have too long of a pause in your heart, then you can kind of go into this weird heart rhythm that sometimes takes a long time to get out of and can have uh, long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And I kind of asked this with the pacemaker when I was, I was very upset. This was during COVID too. um, because it wasn't that long ago. It was about eight months ago. Okay. And I couldn't have visitors. I was in the hospital all alone. And then they told me I'd have a pacemaker and I definitely just lost it. And then I asked that question. I was like, does this have, you know, do I have decreased life expectancy? And she's like, no, she goes, you'll have to get replacement pacemakers, but the pacemaker is more for your symptom management and keeping that heart rate under control. Um, and so that you don't have pauses like that and ultimately hurt yourself. And I was okay. like, okay. Has anyone ever said familial? No, no. Okay. Just why am I getting this wrong? This. Autotom- Why? Just say it again. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Dysautonomia. Dysautonomia. Okay, but nobody's ever said familiar dysautonomia. No. Okay, okay. Um. So, okay, wow. So this all starts happening to you. You find out you have to have a pacemaker. You said very upsetting. Very upsetting because it was something related to your heart? Or very upsetting because you were getting something in your mind that's associated with older people or because you've had enough in your life already and you didn't think you needed one more thing like or or all of that like tell me about being upset when you heard i think it was mostly for the fact that this was i was literally told the day before my 26th birthday and then i actually got the pacemaker on my 26th birthday so i was you know mad that i was there on my birthday like why do i have to be here mad that it was yeah like that this is meant for someone for someone that's 80 years old, not for someone that's 26 years old. Mm -hmm. This is stupid. Um, And then I also would say, because there's been a lot of other, you know, medical things in my life and that just to add this on top, it's like felt unfair. It's just, it's just a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So extended family being just your brothers and sisters first, other autoimmune stuff with them i mean we have one one guy who got diabetes when he was 32 is there anything else um all of my or my same brother that has diabetes and then two of my other sisters also have hypothyroid my mom and then my mom's sister my mom's dad all have rheumatoid arthritis my grandma on my dad's side has lupus Mm -hmm. and probably had undiagnosed rheumatoid arthritis and my brother um i my older brother who's closest to me um he has autism but he also has an autoimmune disorder disorder called pandas which is very rare um i'm not sure what the full acronym is anymore but it caused him to get like IBIG whenever he would have um, a flare up of pandas. IBIG. It's a type of like immunotherapy. Oh, I see. That you okay. have to give to help treat this. So I'll do my best here. Pandas is short for. Oh my God, this is embarrassing for me. <laughs> Pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associ- yes. associated with streptococcal infections yes wow actually i did okay with that how about that that was actually pretty good yeah i did okay a child may be diagnosed with pandas uh when obsessive compulsive disorder ocd tick disorder or both suddenly appear following a strep infection yep that's what happened to your brother yep so he already has like a form of ocd with his autism Mm -hmm. But when he, I mean, being in school, you're exposed to strep all the time. Um, and when he would get this like infection or if he would get like be around a carrier of the infection, his like 
OCD medications would not be effective. And mm-hmm. he would become like overly obsessive compulsive. I see. How does the arthritis present for your mom, for example? She has very bad feet, hands, and knees. Pain, swelling, uh, is it Both. limit her movement? Like, what is it all? Yeah, it's it's, it's hard because she can't be on anything for her rheumatoid arthritis right now because she's had lots of allergic reactions to things in the past. Mm-hmm. But um, especially being in the cold, um, which we are five to six months of the time here in Wisconsin, um, she feels a lot of pain in her hands when it gets really cold in her feet. It's just hard to move around. I see. Um, and she can't take anything because she's having reactions. Do other people in your family, are they getting relief from any medications? Mm, I don't know about my mom's sister. My Mom's dad uh, passed away about eight years ago, Um, but I remember he was on some medications. I can't quite remember what they were, and he felt relief from them to an extent probably until um, near the end of his life where he was just kind of sore all over. What's your um, uh, background? What's the makeup of your family? Where are your parents' families from? We are all from um, like the southeastern Wisconsin area. My mom and dad were both kind of born near Milwaukee. Um, Going back and, before that, like where did their parents and grandparents come from? My, I know my dad's grandparents. They came from a small town up in Wisconsin. Uh, probably. I'm trying to think of like a town near there, but no, it's no, very but small. That, I mean, no, no, the, I, my, give, me, give me a second. <laughs> like Cause I'm 300 not be, people. <laughs> I'm not being clear. So, um, so you guys are like a couple of generations from Wisconsin, but before that, are you Irish, English, Nordic, oh, like that kind of thing? Yeah. So my mom's side of the family is very Polish. And then my dad's side of the family is very, like very Irish. I love for some reason that you said very Polish. I, I, even... I mean, very Polish. I, <laughs> I know they're what like you the mean. last name is Ski, Arski, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> they're very Polish. Um, they're very Polish. <laughs> so, so, so uh, ancestry from Poland and Ireland. Yes. Okay. You guys are like translucent white, I imagine. Can like hold a light up to you and see through you, stuff like that. I think we come from, I don't know quite the area of Poland I come from, but I feel like I come somewhere with more kind of like olivey skin. Like, yes, I'm very pale, especially right now, but uh, I can kind of get that olive glow. Okay. Like someone that lived by the sea or something. (laughs) Look at you bragging. Okay. I got you. Um, I just, you know, I'd like to hear from where people are coming from, especially in this situation where there seems to be stuff on both sides of the family. And, and it's, I mean, it's, pretty thick in your brothers and sisters. Is there anyone untouched in your brothers and sisters? Yes. My sister, um, lucky. She doesn't have anything. Is that her name? Lucky. Her sister's, uh, my sister's name is Elise. Oh, I would rename her lucky if I was you. So, (laughs) right. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing. Wow. And how old is she just for context? She is, oh gosh. Ish. 86, 35. She is my brother who has type 1 diabetes. That's her uh, twin. Twins? Yes. Interesting. So so there's this one person of your six six of you that um, yep. that just doesn't have any autoimmune issues. No. Nope. And she happens to be the twin of, of your brother who does have type 1. Boy, that's yes. crazy, isn't it? You guys yeah. feel cursed? Do you ever talk about it? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, does it, like, a serious conversation? Do you ever sit around and you're like, Jesus, like, what did we do? <laughs> did we piss someone off or something? Or Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, w- I would think it would be hard not to just want to, I don't know, wallow in it for a minute once in a while. It's just, it's so much. Like, it really is a yeah. lot. Does your dad have, like, the greatest job in the world or, like, insurance-wise, I guess? Is- <laughs> My dad, he works in energy efficiency. Okay. Um, 
I'm just saying, and he must have some help. Yeah, he had, he had a very good job with very good insurance. Yeah. He recently just retired. He's, I think you asked earlier if my parents were like in their late 50s. They're actually both, um, my dad is 60, 60, I think, or going to be turning 60. Okay. So your mom's 63, 64? My mom is, yeah, like 62, I think. I like that you don't know how old your parents are. I know. I, I don't. You feel bad? <laughs> I think about their year, but then I can't add it up in my head. Like, I can't subtract and figure it out. <laughs> well, I, I just heard you with your older sister. You were like 86, she's 35. And I was like, 86, she's 35. What is that? And then I was like, oh, she, you're thinking of like when she was born. I um, call it di- diabetes being math because anytime I was, you know, counting carbs, I'd be like 35, 25, that's, you know, 50 or 60, whatever. And people are like, what are you even doing? I'm like, I'm just adding in my head. I said, just don't mind me. <laughs> I don't know. 86, she's 35 is like one of the best sentences anybody's spoken to me ever. So, <laughs> so that's it. okay. So what is your, let's rank your issues. What, what is your um, hardest thing to deal with? Like what causes you I the think- most concern? Maybe if you asked me six months ago, it would have been the dysautonomia, but now it's very much well controlled. I would say now it's the diabetes um, and then the dysautonomia and then hypothyroid has been very well controlled with just my, you know, Synthroid in the morning and it's never been an issue. Gotcha. Cold hands, cold feet. Do you have any joint pain, anything like that? I would just say like cold feet. Um, and then sometimes, um, I would be like extra tired or Mm -hmm. just cold in general, but it's never anything where I'm like, oh gosh, this needs to, this needs to stop. It needs to change. Nothing like that. Yeah. Um, is this something that's generally spoken about or does everybody kind of quietly deal with their stuff? Like in my family, yeah. When you, like, yeah, like growing up, or even now, like it's like when you talk to somebody, is it is the first thing you hear about is their arthritis or their diabetes or their, or is it just kind of not spoken about? Is it just kind of like drifted into the background? We definitely speak about it, but it's not like maybe it comes from when I was younger, my parents did everything in their power to make sure I had a normal life that I could do whatever I wanted. So it's like, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, how's your diabetes been? You know, whatever, but never like a full topic of conversation. So it's definitely there, Mm -hmm. but it's not, doesn't, you know, dominate the conversation. How did your dad do with giving, like going from like waking up every day at 3 a.m. to you going to college? How did he do was he able to disconnect from it or did he stay more, I don't know, involved while you were at school? So they, they stayed involved. They definitely were very nervous. Um, I didn't go very far. I wanted to be in the dorms. That was like my number one thing. So I wanted the full college experience and being my, the parents that they were wanting me to do anything that I, you know, wanted to an extent. Um, they're like, yep, we'll do this, but this is kind of the guidelines. And for the first, um, I was in a trimester school. So we went, um, 10 weeks was like our semesters and every Sunday for the first trimester, I would go back home. I did not have a sensor when I went to school, I had a pump, but no sensor. Mm-hmm. Um, we would, I'd have to log my numbers at school and then we'd go, I would go on Sunday and talk about like my numbers with my parents and figure out like, Oh, do we need to change some things? We go back this week or it looks like you're doing really good or, Hey, you didn't wake up at 3. AM this one day. Like what happened? (laughs) (laughs) 3. AM. What is 3. AM? It's just the time your dad figured that things needed to be looked at. Yeah, I I guess so. I, I bet he just figured it like, Oh, sometime in the middle of the night and 3. AM just sounded like a good time. (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. I just wanted to make sure there was no magic witching hour that I knew that I wasn't sure. It's just the time (laughs) that he kind of settled in with and thought, yeah. Okay. How did you find, Oh, how do you, you, I mean, you're nursing now. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So how did you find 
adjusting to that leaving college or was it not much of an adjustment? It was an adjustment just because I, I worked 12 hour shifts three days a week, but it was day shift. So it was 7 AM to 7 PM. So adjusting wise, like on my days off, sometimes it was hard to figure out if I needed more insulin on my days off, if I needed less insulin. I was waking up at different times on my days off. You know, sometimes I would sleep a lot because I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of trying to figure that out. Um, And then in my current job is, it was a little bit more of an adjustment because my hours at my current job are 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. Yeah, I mean, oh, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) So that's a whole different animal. (laughs) Ugh. I can't imagine like leaving work at three in the morning. I I've adjusted. It's it's fine because it's it's still dark outside. So like when I get home, it's easy for me to just fall asleep mm-hmm. because it's dark out. Is there any um aspect of your life that led you to nursing? The diabetes, for sure. Um I knew from the time I was like seven or eight that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I had a nurse practitioner at the diabetes clinic who is still my mentor to, to this day. Mm -hmm. And I want to be just like her. I was like, I want to be just like, you know, this nurse practitioner. And, um, so I'm currently a nurse practitioner school. I just started Um, the plan is to, you know, kind of fulfill the dream, um, so to speak. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that considered grad school? Yes. Okay. How long will you be doing that for until you're on the other side of this and ready to work? Right. So I am doing it part-time so that I can still do part-time work. Um, So it'll be four years by the time I'm done. Wow. Will you be able to stay at the same institution, do you think? That is the hope, yes. Okay. Uh, and you're not leaving Wisconsin, even though it's super cold and it makes sense to leave. I, you know, it, I can't say never say never, but just having family and friends so close. Um, that's like one of the m- main things that I love is that all of them are really, really close. Yeah. Um, so it'd be hard to leave. I hear, I hear you. I just, I mean, I walked outside today and I'll do, I'll just have to like edit this later. Um, and this is New Jersey and it's only December. And I walked outside and I would thought this, this is exactly went through my head. It's so cold. <laughs> and so I, I think I would die in Wisconsin. <laughs> I just, it was I, uh, five degrees yesterday. So that was really fun. <laughs> oh my God. I see. Now if that happened, I assume everyone just stays in their house and doesn't move, but that's not what happens. Everybody just gets up and lives, right? Yep. Let's see. Put on your layers and you get on with your day. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't. I'd call out. I'd be like, I can't come today. I don't know if you noticed. It's five degrees outside. <laughs> we'll do this again tomorrow. Um, is, it, is it like one of those days where, I mean, does the heater like, just run constantly? <laughs> you just, are you... I mean, pretty much. And I'm like, just looking at myself. I'm like, oh, this electric bill, but whatever. I'm not going to be cold in my house. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. I wouldn't be good at it. Like my body, the cold hits me and my body tenses up and I'm just like, Oh no, 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 it's cold. And then I just start immediately thinking about when spring is coming. I'll spend like the next three months just wondering when spring will be here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I don't understand. Uh, okay. You guys getting married? We are. Yes. Um, Do you have a date? I is think- that soonish? Um, we're thinking we, we just got engaged a couple months ago. So oh. probably, uh, 2023 in the summer, just because, um, we want to get married, you know, downtown and everything is pretty much booked unless you want like a Sunday brunch wedding. Everything is booked for 2022. Yeah. That's still COVID like, cause everybody pushed, right? Like, yes. Yeah. My, my son's friend just got married like the day before Thanksgiving, which is not a day you would normally get oh, married a, yeah you, you that's know. different um and it just it's when they could because they were supposed to get married like a year and a half ago right and they weren't able to um have you ever had covid no okay i was just asking because no. you had an illness arrive during it so i just wanted to ask right is there um 
anything I'm not asking you because you have such a varied thing that I'm just following the course of my ideas, but I don't know if I'm missing anything. I don't know either. I, I wrote down a lot of notes when I was with my parents, but mostly cause I was like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to forget anything. Um, Oh, my, this is, I don't know if it's like funny, but my dad, it has like a deathly fear of needles. <laughs> That's uh, pretty funny. Like, yeah. <laughs> like he would pass out. Like he like gets all pale and then passes out. No, um, really? Yeah. So like when he, my brother, um, I don't know if this is genetic. I know it's not uh, autoimmune, but uh, four of my siblings and I had scoliosis. Um, three of them had to have surgery, and then I had the lovely back brace. Um, so add that on top of diabetes and hypothyroid, I also had a back brace. How long did you wear the back brace for? Two and a half years. No kidding. You know, In high school, yeah. While we're talking, I just picked around here, and I found you online. You're a tiny person, too, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, unless this boyfriend of yours is like five feet tall. Like, you're pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're this little tiny kid with a back brace on? Yep. Did you have any friends at all or how did that go? I did. Yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, but I had to get it within two weeks of starting high school, my back brace. So I was. Oh, no kidding. I was about as mad as I was when I heard about the pacemaker. I was about that much livid. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would. I think I, I could see exactly where you're coming from. Like, wait, I'm going to high school and I need a what? Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's not I think true. my mom could tell I was just like super angry about it. Yeah. Um, and she was like, we're going to go to the mall. And we're going to get you a bunch of flowy things to wear. So people don't have to see it if you don't want to. Right. And so I probably wore flowy, you know, whatever people wore in the early 2000s. Um, well, this brings up a good question, honestly, because you seem very pleasant. So are you hiding it or are you okay? Oh, I'm okay. Why? I'm, <laughs> like, why? Yeah, like how? Uh, how maybe? Oh, I guess I don't know. I feel, I feel like I've always been a very positive person. I feel like I don't know how to explain it. There's things. There are worse things that could happen. There are, are worse things that I could be angry about, and it's like, yeah, like this back brace is super irritating and it's itchy and I hate going to gym and then putting my back brace back on. But at least, you know, I'm here. I can walk. I have very much like that outlook on life. Like I could be a lot worse and this is such a small thing in the grand scheme of whatever. Did the back brace actually correct the scoliosis? It did for me because I beat a diabetic i'm already very disciplined with myself <laughs> you wore that damn brace huh <laughs> yeah so i wore that day thing so i was not gonna have surgery um so i wore it 20 hours a day for i think two years and then the last like half a year um i got to only wear it like for 10 hours so i would just wear it wear it when i was at home and like when i would sleep wow that shook me for some reason the the 20 hours a day for two years thing yeah. I was like, oh gosh, that's a lot. And I time. and I wore it. <laughs> did you did you wear the mouth? Did you go through multiple ones? I can't remember. I think I think I maybe had two of them. Okay. Most. Hey, um, did you just look away from the microphone or we're having a problem? You went away for a second. I can't hear your voice. Oh, can you hear me? There it is. Yeah, yeah. You don't remember. Okay. You might Yeah, I did turn away, I think. So did it smell? <laughs> <laughs> um probably um they gave us these like weird cotton tees to wear underneath and but it was like thick cotton yeah. and it kept like all the sweat in and it was really gross yeah. tell me about your dating life during those two years nobody oh i didn't yeah, yeah. i was just gonna say like, you're like we'll wait on that i mean you're a little young but still like you're probably like yeah well, maybe when the brace is gone I, I, it does bring me to a question. Um, you're a young person. You know, you're pretty recently engaged. Um, when you find out about the pacemaker and this next issue, is there any point where you look at your your boyfriend, your fiance, and think, I can't keep telling him there are things wrong with me? 
like because at one point like are you worried that somebody's just gonna bail on you or does that not come into your head it definitely doesn't come in my head okay um he's the type of person so you remember how i said i'm very polish or like my dad my mom's side is very polish he is like very 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 polish like he speaks polish um So it's funny that I found him. So being very Polish and Eastern European, he's very, um, I don't know if reserved is the right word, but he's very calm, um, which I think helps with my not calmness. Um, So anything that comes up with diabetes, my health, whatever, he's like, all right, we'll just make it work. We'll keep doing what we need to do. You know, do you need anything? What can I do? Mm. Um, and that's kind of the person that I need is someone that yeah. knows how big of a deal things are, like when things happen, but doesn't get all anxious and is like, oh my gosh, where is this? Where is that? What do we need to do? Because mm-hmm. that would just add to my anxiety that I don't need. Yeah, no, I understand. I just, I mean, you know, there's there's people in this world who would hear, you know, one thing and be like, okay, two things go, oh, I don't know. And you, know, you start getting to like, I'm a, getting a pacemaker when I'm 26 and you can see where people might think like, some people might say, I, I don't want to be involved in this. Like, I love you, but I can't do this. But he's he's steadfast. He, he He's steady, right? Yes. Yeah, good for you. That's cool. Good for him, too, by the way. Because you guys are young, you know? Yep. Probably don't feel young, but you are. So. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we've been together for eight years. Um, we started dating when I first got to college, when we both first got to college. Um, I, I was going to say when the back brace came off, but I, <laughs> the back brace was no longer in the picture. <laughs> You're like, my spine is straight. Find me a boy. Uh, <laughs> how, um, since you have older siblings, are there any grandchildren for your parents? Yes, I have two nieces and a nephew, um, and they are my pride and joys. They are. The two nieces are very close in age. They're four and a half, and the other one's almost five. Mm -hmm. And then my nephew is um, nine. It was 20. He's 21 months. Is there any autoimmune with them yet? No. No, nothing. Okay. Do you think it's something everybody's, like, thinking about? Yes. (laughs) Right? I I would start one of those. Like, you ever seen those um, days without injury at work calendars? If yes. I, I'd, I'd have like a days without autoimmune calendar at my house. I'd like put a, like a <laughs> line on it every day. I'd be like, oh my God, we're winning. Um, right. Because everything about your family history says that this could happen at any time, at any level or degree of, you know, like you were two, your brother's in his thirties. Like, so there's no feeling that you're, I mean, not that it's, not that there's anything, you know, um, that's real about that idea, but you know, you get it in your head. Like if everybody was diagnosed when they were 10, by the time you were 20, you'd think you got, you got past it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, right. But there's no feeling there for you. Cause it, it happened to somebody between two and, and in their thirties. Right. Hmm. All right. I, I mean, I don't want to bum you out. You are really up. Oh, person. you're fine. <laughs> How did you find this podcast and why do you listen to it? So COVID hit March, 2020. Yeah. March, 2020. I was getting canceled all the time at work because no one wanted to come to the ER um, because, you know, COVID's everywhere. So I was maybe working one day a week, like one 12 hour shift. So I was like, I need something to do. Um, And I don't know if someone mentioned it on Instagram or if I just looked up diabetes podcasts on the internet and then saw yours. And I was like, "Mm, I've never really been into podcasts, but let's just see. Let's just see what this is about. And I started listening um, at one point and it was someone's story. And I was like, wow. I was like, this is actually kind of cool to listen to other diabetic stories and like how they were diagnosed and how they're doing now. Um, And then I kind of found your pro tips. So I was like, maybe my diabetes could be a little bit better. Maybe that will be my COVID project is to get my A1C below, you know, a certain level. So I was like, let's do the diabetes pro tips and listen to a couple of those. Learned about like the pre-bolusing and the, uh, being bold with insulin. And I was like, okay, this is odd. Because I have an endocrine who is 
very lovely. Um, I do really like him, but he's very, <laughs> you're going to laugh. You're going to laugh so hard again. He's very, very Polish. So also very like, all right, this is what we're doing. Let me grab your pump. I am changing this. And then I will see you in three months. Like that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't so he know. He helps me. I, I, by the way, I still don't have any contacts for ver- contacts for very, very, very Polish, but it's so close to being the episode title. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Because it means something to you that it doesn't mean to me. <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out, I, I, I don't think I'm going to actually figure out what it is, but, but what, all right. So just what about being Polish <laughs> was that description of they're just like, all right, here, make it. So is it stoicness? Is it just. Not stoic, but just like very blunt to the point. Um they just have like an Eastern Europeans are just very like a very special breed. Like I don't know how to describe them. No, it feels um, like something you heard growing up and that it resonates with you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't <laughs> I just I I'm delighted by it. I've never once <laughs> thought of myself as although I'm adopted, so I don't really know what I am. But um okay. I've done have the, you ever done like ancestry or anything? Yeah, I did. I think I'm mostly Italian. Okay. So I don't know, though. When I do something that's very, very me, I don't think of it as being very, very Italian <laughs> or whatever it is. I mean, honestly, that, that test can be completely wrong. I only paid a hundred dollars for it. Who knows how legitimate that is, <laughs> you know? Uh, but um, okay, no, I mean, I don't have any problem with it. It's just very interesting. So you had this kind of set it and forget it. They were like, "All right, try this." Are you willing to tell me where your A one C was before you found the podcast? You don't have to if you don't want to. Oh, um, it was probably like. Maybe 7.6, 7.8. Okay. And now? Maybe something like that. So nothing terrible. Right. Um, And my last A1C was 6.9. So it's nice. still trending in the right direction. Um, I had some hiccups with, um, I also had like major jaw surgery. Well, of course you did. Last year. Wait, wait um, what happened to your where jaw? Where I had to eat pureed foods for six weeks. Get the hell so, out of here. What happened to your jaw? Um, I have just like a, it must be genetic. Um, oh, I think everything. I, I want to say I think everything with you is genetic, but go ahead. <laughs> what is it called? Exactly. Like, I don't know how else to <laughs> say I'm like, it didn't come from anything. It's just like something I knew that had to be done since I was 18. And I just kept putting it off. And then. Finally, I said, after I graduated nursing school, I said, fine, I'll actually go through with all this stuff. So I had to be in braces for a certain amount of time and then had to get my wisdom teeth out. Then I had the surgery um, where they had to like, you know, put my upper jaw, they had to break it and then put it back into place basically. And so then I was on pureed foods for six weeks. So Uh that was quite a challenge uh, with diabetes and being like mostly everything that it could be pureed had carbs and just a lot of it. Yeah. Were you working during those six weeks or were you at home? I got to be off for like three and a half weeks. And then I went back to work um, the other three weeks. Or With like whatever. your jaw wired shut? No, no, my jaw, it had a splint in it. It was not wired shut, but it had like a splint just to keep the mouth together on the top, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but that came out at like two and a half weeks. Okay. Wow. It, it kinda, is there any other weird stuff that's happened to you that we haven't talked about? Um, I, I think that's it. <laughs> you think that's it? You're not sure though, right? Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think that's pretty much the extent of everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The diabetes, <laughs> the brace. The surgery, the pacemaker. Hey, your breasts are like on the front and everything. Like you're like, the, yes. yeah, okay. <laughs> oh <my laughs> I'm breaking a bone besides the, my jaw that had to be broken. But <laughs> you have five toes on each foot. They point forward. Yes. Yeah. All right. Jesus. <laughs> are, do you worry about having kids? Seriously? Um, a little. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, I mean, I would if I was you. <laughs> I'd be yeah, little... like we'll definitely have to do like some genetic testing and figure all that out. But we've never put off adoption. Like adoption's always been on the table for us to think about. So yeah, yeah, maybe you could adopt like a very, very, very like 
a, I don't know, Australian kid or something like that. Or, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm being like, I'm joking because, I mean, it's a lot of stuff and you have such a good way about you. But I mean, you got to think, right? You have a kid, something is going to be up. Right. Right. And do you, and, and I guess my question is, is had this, has this been enough for you to deal with that it feels like something you wouldn't want someone else to have to deal with? Or does it not feel that way to you? I don't think it feels that way to me. I don't know why. Cause if I say that to a person, they're like, wow, that's a lot. And I'd be like, yeah. So, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. I'm still walking. I still have my mind. I can still work, you know, I can yeah, still I do all the things. Right. I don't want to be all new agey, but it's your thing and it, it it's everybody has the thing and this stuff has been yours and you're still going. And so it doesn't seem like impossible to you. It's just, it, it wasn't, I mean, I guess the way you would hope for it to be, but right. when it's happening to you, you don't, I guess you don't miss a different life, right? Because this is yours. Right. Okay. Uh, that makes sense to you? Yes. All right. Yeah. I don't know. I was just interested because I feel like if we just keep talking, I'm going to learn that your toenails grow on the bottom of your feet or something like that or, <laughs> you know, something. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you do you ever take advantage of your job? Like, you must be able to, like, talk to people and be like, hey, let me just run some symptoms by you. What kind of nursing do you do? Uh, I'm a pediatric emergency room nurse. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with you anymore then. <laughs> is that a stressful job or sad? Um, it can be. Um, it kind of depends. Um, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the day, on the day and kind of where I am and in the ER and everything. And recently there's been a lot that has happened. Um, but um, overall, my coworkers are very supportive. And we always talk about stuff and just say, you know, hey, this was a really hard case or, yeah. you know, hey, like I'm still having, I'm struggling with this child I took care of or whatever. But for the most part, I feel okay Good. about it emotionally yeah, no. and everything. But yeah, I know somebody that works in a pick you and they said it can be overwhelming sometimes. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't, listen. I think we're going to stop just because <laughs> I mean, you're out of maladies to talk about. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess just let me finish by asking you, like, what made you want to come on the podcast? I think just to show that, like, you can have all these ailments, all these things, and you can still live a very positive life and taking care of yourself is your health is your number one investment and just keep working on that and you can be the pediatric ER nurse or you can be the person that has a fiance and a house and a cat and you can live your normal life even though you have all these things and yeah I think just showing that maybe could help someone else that maybe is feeling a little bit down right now I appreciate that thank you I appreciate you uh, being willing to go through this and the joking around and um oh yeah and all that stuff six kids i didn't even ask you about that your parents are just like little bunny rabbits you know what i mean <laughs> i let you go well cause... four four of them technically have a different dad and then me and my brother that i'm closest to have the same dad wait hannah wait <laughs> jesus hold on a second <laughs> wait <laughs> all right all right hold on there are six children yes the first four your mom had with the person who's not your dad yes and then yep, she was married before i see wait a minute hold on so you're but old... yes i understand there has to be there has to be autoimmune on both. things on their dad's side or something no i mean but you know, well, maybe not necessarily because no, your mom's got the arthritis so we're okay with that but i'm saying yeah. that like your your older brother is with your mother, but a different father, and he has type one. Yes. Okay. And your mother then has two babies with another person, and you end up with type one. Yep. Okay. So she's kind of like the 
she's the linchpin in that, it would seem. Right. And and the man who stayed up at night is your is your natural father. Yes. Gotcha. And they're still married now. Yes. Got it. And there's autoimmune on your dad's side of the family because you mentioned lupus. Yes. But you don't know about your older brother's father? I don't. Got it. Okay. I just wanted to parse that out to make sure I understood it. Yep. Okay. All right. Cool. That's got to be it. All right. I'm going to stop on that because my brain hurts. (laughs) 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 And I've already recorded a pro tip today that was an hour and a half long earlier today. So I think I'm running out of steam, I think. Um, oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let me say thank you then, and uh, and hold on one second for me, okay? A huge thanks to Hannah for coming on the show and sharing her story. She drank out of the Christmas tree. I'm not going to forget that anytime soon. I'm also not going to forget to go to contournext.com forward slash juice box and learn more about that Contour Next One blood glucose meter. While I'm on the internet, I'll be looking at dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Get yourself the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor, and maybe you're eligible for a free 10-day trial. You'll find out at the link. There are links to Contour, Dexcom, and all the sponsors at juiceboxpodcast.com or right there in the show notes of the podcast player you're listening in right now. Speaking of that podcast player, are you subscribed and following the Juicebox podcast in your favorite audio app like Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on and on? I'm in all of them. And if you follow or subscribe, depending on whatever your app lets you do, they just use different words. It means follow. You know what I mean? If you do that, it really helps the podcast. It helps it almost as much as when you leave a great five-star rating and review wherever you're listening or when you tell another person about the show. Speaking of the show, perhaps you're looking for the Diabetes Pro Tip episodes. Well, they begin in your podcast player at episode 210. They're also available at juiceboxpodcast.com and diabetesprotip.com. It's a lot of series in this podcast. Did you know about it? How about the Diabetes? How about the Defining Diabetes series? 47, I think, uh, uh, episodes up to now and growing every day. Defining Diabetes is also available at juiceboxpodcast.com. It's available at diabetesprotip.com. And it goes back so far in the show, I don't even I don't even know, like three years ago, 2019 it started, I think, when we defined bolus. You're not going to want to miss the After Dark series covering topics from depression and self-harm to trauma and addiction and everything in between. Adult topics real things that happen to real people who happen to have type 1. There's a complete series about algorithm pumping. You can learn about Tandem's Control IQ, the new Omnipod 5, or Loop. I think we even have one about, yeah, we do, the Minimed 670G. The How We Eat series talks about how different people eat. Different listeners come on, talk about their Eating styles, Bernstein, FODMAP, keto, flexitarian, intermittent fasting, plant-based, gluten-free, low-carb, and on and on. The Diabetes Variable series talks about those things that impact your blood sugars that you don't think about all the time, like alcohol, menopause, weight change, temperature, trampolines, going to Walmart, all the stuff that impacts your blood sugar that you never think of. All of this information is at juiceboxpodcast.com. If you're looking for lists of these episodes, join the private Facebook group. At the top, click on Featured, and all the lists are in there. They're beautiful, made by Isabel, the lovely, lovely lady who helps me with the private Facebook group, which, by the way, has about 26,000 people in it now, and you could be one of them. Just people talking about using insulin, diabetes, and helping each other. Juice Box Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. Before I go, let me remind you, t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box takes fewer than 10 minutes to take the survey you'll help people living with type 1 diabetes and you'll support the show thank you so much for listening i'll be back very soon with another episode of the juice box podcast